Um, my name is Connie, and today I, along with Max, Matt, Stephen, and Yao, will be presenting to you our senior design project, which is a mobile fluorescence microscope for point-of-care diagnostics. The clinical application that we have chosen to focus on is tuberculosis. Currently, one-third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. Five to ten percent of these will develop into an active form of the disease, which, if left untreated, will kill 50 percent of those infected. Every year, 9 million new cases of tuberculosis are reported. The majority of these are in low- and middle-income countries, such as those in, A in Africa and in Asia. They have 95% of tuberculosis cases and 98% of tuberculosis deaths. Therefore, to effectively combat tuberculosis, we really need an accurate and rapid way to diagnose the disease in these types of resource-limited settings. Currently, the main method used to diagnose the disease is direct sputum smear light microscopy, in which a physician will take a nasal swab, smear it onto a slide, and examine it under a light microscope. Now, this is great in that it can be performed in any type of setting, is really cheap, and has really high specificity values, which means that there are very few false positives. The problem with this method, however, is that it takes three days, because two samples are required to be acquired on two consecutive days, and the evaluation takes 24 hours. What this means is that not all patients will come back, and we will lose um, on some of these diagnoses. In addition, the detection limit of the current technology is 10,000 organisms per milliliter of sputum. Anything below that, and the sensitivity and specificity values are very low. Um, a superior alternative to light microscopy is fluorescence microscopy, in that it is 10% more sensitive at diagnosing tuberculosis, has the same high specificity values, and only takes one day. However, the problem with fluorescence microscopy is that it's expensive. One unit costs $10,000. Um, it requires a trained operator, and it's insufficiently port portable, which makes it really infeasible in the types of settings where most tuberculosis cases occur. Um, for this reason, we have come up with our senior design project idea, which Max will now proceed to explain. So the goal we set out at the beginning of the year is to build an affordable, portable fluorescence microscope integrated into a smartphone with fully automated image processing, um, with fully automated image processing for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Now, the mechanism underlying our project is fluorescence, fluorescence microscopy, as Connie mentioned. Fluorescence microscopy is only possible due to the wide availability of fluorescence tags. A fluorescent tag is something that binds specifically to a cell and not the surroundings. This tag responds to a certain a wavelength of light called the excitation wavelength and fluoresces in a different wavelength, wave, wavelength of light called the fluorescent wavelength. Now, we're using tuberculosis, so a typical fluorescent microscope works like this. We have a halogen light, which illuminates from the bottom. It goes through a filter, which picks out the excitation wavelength that we're interested in. This excitation, excitation wavelength then illuminates and interacts with the uh, fluorescent tag. This fluorescent tag then fluoresces in a different wavelength. Both these wavelengths hit the next filter, which picks out only the fluorescent wavelength, which then creates the images you see above. Now, the problem with this design are the filters. The filters are not only expensive, but, but if you want to do multiple colors, which is often needed in diagnostics, you need a mechanism which can turn and change the filter. So our real innovation in this project is overcoming this barrier. We got rid of, we got rid of the halogen light and replaced it with a multicolor LED, and we replaced the top filter with a side illumination. So by side illuminating, we take advantage of the actual holder of the cell and use it in, as an optical fiber. By side illuminating and using it as an optical fiber, we trap much of the illumination light. This illumination light is still allowed to interact with the fluorescent material, which fluoresces in all directions, and due to the angle of contact with the top of the glass, it can leave and create the image like you see above. Now the compromise we made, that we got rid of the bottom filter by using a multicolor LED, we got rid of the top filter by leveraging the properties of the actual holding of the cell uh, and using it as an optical fiber, was worthwhile, evidenced by the image you see. Now, to bring this mechanism to life, we created a device, as you can see in my hand. We used a Samsung Galaxy S4. We built a phone case, which the Samsung Galaxy uh, fits into. We modeled this phone such that we can press fit a lens. This comes together with the bottom case, the cell sample holder, which houses the LEDs and the circuit. The circuit's responsible for, uh, for talking to the phone and coordinating the imaging. The circuit also powers LEDs. The cell sample holder also positions our cells such that our phone can see them. 
Now, this project would not have been possible just a couple of years ago. There's a couple revolutions going on in engineering that made it possible for five undergraduates to do this. The first is manufacturing. As an undergraduate, I now have access to manufacture something on the micron scale with 3D printing. The next is an integrated circuitry. I now have cheap, powerful components such as the LEDs and much of the circuit we use uh, that can power this project. Lastly is computation. We now have very, very powerful small devices that can carry out huge computational loads. With that said, I'm excited. I'm very excited <laughs> okay, to ask Stephen to show you our device in action. So our device is very user friendly. After loading a fluorescently tagged sample into our device, the user may then input patient information, as you see, and also test parameters. At the beginning of image capture, the sample is illuminated with both green LED and blue LED light from the side. The smartphone then takes magnified images of these samples and re um, saves it. So after a while, the application returns a preview of the two images. If the user is happy with the images, then he or she can send these images to a local server, which will then perform image processing. After image processing, these images are then saved onto the server and then returned in the form of a diagnosis, as you see. Right, so after these images are captured, they're then sent to our server, where we have a MATLAB script to process the images. The image analysis algorithm consists of four basic steps, and I'll mention each briefly to go in more de in detail on each one. So we first separate the image into its separate channels. After this, we find the spots in the image um, by looking for regional maxima. After this, we find a threshold above which we consider a spot to be a fluorescent spot. And then finally, finally we just do some cleanup um, algorithms on the image. So in this example, we have carmine bees, which fluoresce in red, and we excite them using green LED light. So we separate out the red channel from the image to get rid of this excited light and only keep the admitted light. After this, we're going to look for spots in the image by looking for regional maxima. A regional maximum is just a pixel for which all surrounding pixels have a lower intensity value. Once we have all these regional maxima, we have this large set of data, some of which correspond to fluorescent spots, and some which just correspond to like stochastic noise in the image. And so we want to find the appropriate threshold value. To do that, we create a plot in which the x-axis is intensity, and the y-axis is the log of the number of spots that will remain if we choose that particular intensity value as our threshold. And then we just choose the region on the plot. Through experimentation, we found that an accurate threshold value can be determined by just finding that plateau region of the graph. And we do this through an uh, automated analysis script. And then the final step is just to remove artifacts. If there's um, smudges or blurs on the cover slip, um, this can result in a lot of reflected light coming back to the lens. So we create a binary image where we just have uh, regions representing where um, we found the regional maximas. We dilate these regions outwards and get rid of connected components that have greater than a certain number of pixels. And these are just some sample images taken on our device. Um, this shows that we can get very high resolution for um, imaging objects that are just on the micron scale. To evaluate our device, we show that it can measure bacterial cells of similar size and morphology to tuberculosis cells. In this experiment, we use BCG cells. So BCG is a string of bovine tuberculosis that's usually used as a surrogate to human tuberculosis in laboratory for safety reasons. And then we prepare samples of BCG cells in a concentration gradient, and then we measure the number of cells detected by our device. The result shows that Above a concentration of 10,000 cells per mil, our device consistently detected more cells with higher sample concentration, and it has a detection limit of approximately 10,000 cells per mil, which is on par with the state of our diagnostic device. In applications, patient samples often come with a minor type of cell. You have human cells, you have maybe some other diseases, and that creates a great no amount of noise for diagnosis. Several methods have been developed to increase diagnostic accuracy in such kind of settings. For example, differential diagnosis, and color staining. However, none of this method will work without a capability to detect multiple color fluorescence. Therefore, we measure our device capability to distinguish fluorescently tagged molecules. We image three different types of fluorescently tagged molecules, and then we split the images into RGB, RGB color channels. And then we plot the intensity of each detected object against the combination of illumination light and color channels. And you can see the resulting graph shows that each fluorescent tag molecules has a different intensity characteristic, and therefore they resign in a different position on the plot. That means that using k-means clustering, we show that our device will be able to have a significant separation of these fluorescent bees, and therefore it can distinguish fluorescent tag molecules. And now you ask, why does it matter we can do multiple color? Let's show me an example of why the significance matters. 
So HIV infected patients often incur infections of tuberculosis and PCB attack with pneumonia concurrently. And with multiple color detection, we can have one patient sample be stained with two different types of fluorescent stain, let's say green and blue. And then our device will be able to detect and diagnose both infections with one patient sample. That greatly expands the applications of our devices. Next, I'll hand on to Stephen to compare our devices to its current state of art. So our device has very significant results, but just how much does this device cost? Well, here you see a price breakdown of our final prototype, and as you can see, after summing everything, we've spent about $575 producing this device. But what is the significance of that value? Well, here on this table, we compare our device with not only a light microscope, but the state-of-the-art fluorescence microscope. As you can see, the 575 value is much, much lower than a $10,000 value of a fluorescence microscope. Not only that, but it, has, it is on par in terms of marginal cost of diagnosis and also the tech detection limit. Not only that, it also has the ability to multiplex and distinguish different fluorescently tagged objects. So in summary, our, our device is a portable, affordable, user-friendly solution for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. But then why, not, why stop there? With this design, our device is able to also diagnose almost any bacterial disease. Therefore, we as a team are confident that our device will greatly impact the future of point-of-care diagnostics. Last but not least, we'd just like to acknowledge these following individuals or organizations without which this project would not have been possible. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions. So even without the infrastructure of internet, you still have a lot of 3G connections. Um, that being said, though, anywhere where you can have a laptop, you can have a local server set up to run the diagnostics locally. The image processing we're doing is not that intensive. It can be run on a, on a computer very easily. Um, so as long as you have a laptop, you can set up a local server for that. Okay, thank you. 